ABC News presentation. Welcome to Interface here on SABC2. My name is Tembi Samachele. Well, as I'm sure you've heard by now, the remains of South African journalist Net Nakasa have finally arrived on South African soil. Nakasa died in exile in 1965, and the apartheid government would not grant his family permission to bring him back home for burial. Nakasa's homecoming has been described as a proud moment for the journalism fraternity, his family, and the government of South Africa. But what is the significance of all of this, and what role did Nakasa play in South Africa's anti-apartheid struggle. Well, before we get into those questions and into our discussion, let's have a quick look at this report by SABC reporter Linda Mgobozi. South African Airways Flight 551 touched down at 1.30 yesterday afternoon. African drums and music welcome a sign of the soil. Nathaniel Ndazana Nakasa was finally home. He was born in Lusigisigi in the Eastern Cape in 1937, but grew up in Durban. He is the son of a teacher and a freelance writer. He cut his journalism teeth at the local Ilanga La Senatal newspaper, later moving to Johannesburg, writing for Drum magazine. He became the first black journalist at the Rand Daily Mail. A very inquisitive journalist. He wanted to find out things and he asked the difficult questions. Um, if you look through his writings, you will find that he is still searching for these answers to these difficult questions at a time when it was dangerous to ask those questions. His return holds a strong message for journalists. It's a very important day. Uh, NET represented the best amongst us in terms of commitment to good writing, uh, to learning, and uh, to quality journalism, all of which are important things that, as journalists who are still practicing today, his return must focus our minds on those three things. Efforts to repatriate Nakasa's remains began almost a decade ago, led by former KwaZulu Natal Premier Zuli Mkize and Sanef. This has been like tears of joy for the family, tears of joy for our KwaZulu Natal people, and we are very grateful about that progress. Government also urged all South Africans to emulate the courage displayed by someone like Nakasa. We are celebrating his life what he stood for, the values uh, he espoused as he was living his life. Values such as courage, values such as love for your country and your people. And, and those uh, are values we would want to see in our society general, but particularly amongst journalists. His homecoming, a relief for the family. He loved reading, he loved his country, he had an edge to explore the world. He was hoping to return home and share the knowledge he gained overseas. For 50 years, he lay near American human rights activist Malcolm X at the Fancliffe Cemetery in New York. Nakasa wrote before his departure, I am a native of nowhere. But on the 13th of next month, he will find his final resting place at Chesterville in Durban. Well, that report by Linda Mkoposi giving us a little bit more of an insight into the story of Net Nakasa. Well, joining me now to talk a little, bit, a, bit, a little bit more about this is Ryan Brown, who is the author of the book Native of Nowhere, and that is the book based on the life of Net Nakasa, and also Matata Tzedu, who is the executive director of the South African National Editors Forum, and he is here to talk to us a little bit more about this. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining Thank you. me. So for those South Africans who have seen the story of Net Nakasa in the press, the coming home, and they think, okay, that sounds interesting, that looks good, but who is this guy and why is he important to South Africa today? What would you say, Ryan? Well, listen, I think there's a direct line between the 
rowdy and courageous South African press that you have today, and these guys who are writing, guys and women writing in the 50s and 60s, um, these writers for Drum Magazine uh, and for a lot of other publications across South Africa, uh, you know, who spoke truth to power at a time when it was very, very difficult to do so. I think South African journalism today is a direct legacy of that. Mm, but why is that story so significant in 2014? You know, I think um, people like Nat Nakasa remind us, for one thing, of the many, many different ways that apartheid was experienced by people in this country. Uh, someone like Nat Nakasa left a very detailed record of the life he lived um, and the country he saw. Uh, you know, and, and so remembering his life isn't just remembering a single life, it's remembering um, a wider set of experiences and, and you know, the, the very uh, distinctive ways in which people mm. experience that era in South Africa. history. That's it. So, Mr. Nagasa once wrote that he was a native of nowhere, he was a stateless man, a permanent wanderer. How do you describe him almost 50 years down the line? Um, when I became a Neiman Fellow and got to Harvard, I pulled his file um, at the foundation and went through it to just try and understand him. I'd read the world of Ned Nakasa when I was a young uh, person, uh, <coughs> younger than I am now, <laughs> of course. Uh, and what I saw uh, uh, in, in, in that file was a man tortured by the inability to come back home. So the, the, the love to learn led him to accept a condition that later became too much for him. And so when he was describing himself as a, <clears throat> a stateless person, a citizen of nowhere, he, he was really uh, uh, describing something that he was feeling inside and wanted to seriously come back. So today, as we look at what is happening now, it is really a fulfillment of a wish of this one person mm. to come back to Africa. And for me, when I look at what is happening, the resources that are being put into this. Some people may start asking questions, why spend so much on this one mm -hmm. guy? Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, it is not even just about him. It is the symbolism of our commitment to be able to bring back wherever our own are, bring them back home and give them the peace that they longed for. So one would have thought that because the apartheid government refused him entry back home, that come 1994, this would have been one of those priority cases where you say, uh, let's go and get whoever was not allowed to come back home and let's bury them, give them a dignified burial here at home. Why has it taken so long for this to happen? Well, uh, <clears throat> there are many uh, South African souls that are lying all over the world. Right. Um, in some, uh, like Ned, fortunate enough to have a marked grave where you can actually go back. There are people who fell in battle. Uh, some are lying in unmarked graves. Some, no grave at all. The, the, there's been a process led by government to bring back as many people as is possible. But with Ned's case in particular, uh, it started um, um, in, in around 1997 um, to, to, to start the process of trying to bring him back home. And it, the whole legal process in the United States took forever. Um, <clears throat> there were issues of resources until Zuel Mkize, who was premier of KwaZulu-Natal at the time, stepped forward and said he would make uh, the money available for this. That really gave the impetus. and. It kicked in the state resources, uh, both in terms of uh, the uh, uh, embassy in the U.S. and the consulate in New York, particularly to really assist with the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So, Ryan, as you were writing this book and uh, going through, you know, aspects of his life beyond the story that we see, which is uh, here's a young South African journalist coming to, uh, going to America on a fellowship, gets it and now can't go back home and doesn't have any means to support himself in a strange land. What is the story beyond that? Who is the man that you've discovered as you've written this book? 
Well, you know, I think one thing that's really interesting about Nat, and it's not just true of Nat, it's true of the entire generation uh, he comes from, is this is a group of people who um, in their lives didn't have to imagine what South Africa would look like without apartheid because they'd actually lived in a South Africa that didn't have apartheid. Um, Nat Nakasa was born in 1937, so 11 years before the National Party came to power. Um, and, he, and he grew up uh, in a community in Durban, in Cato Manor, um, and in South Africa that, you know, while still fraught with many racial tensions and inequalities, um, was quite different from the one that followed it, you know, in the decades to come of National Party rule. Um, and, and I think that colored the whole way he lived his life and the way he wrote um, and reported and experienced South Africa. He knew another South Africa was possible. And, and I think he also, therefore, was able to have a kind of incredible sense of humor about uh, the injustices of apartheid. He understood just how incredibly absurd of a system this was. And he thought, something this, this absurd, this illogical, cannot survive. And so the way I'm going to deal with it, um, you know, until it dies, that, de that inevitable death, is to laugh at it, um, is to poke fun at the incredible... Um, you know, absurdity of thinking mm -hmm. a system like mm -hmm. this. Could I'd go love on. to. I'd love to ask you the same question that it said when we come back from a break. But we have to take a short break now. And uh, when we come back, we're going to get more about the story of this man and also some of your thoughts. If you give us your thoughts on Facebook, it's Interface on SABC Two, or you can find us on Twitter at Tembi Samahele or at Interface on SABC. Just stay with us. back you're watching interface here on sabc2 and we're talking about the story of net nakasa was an anti-apartheid struggle icon and also uh, a neiman fellow I at harvard university and we are talking to mr matata tsedu who is the executive director of sanef and also ryan brown who's the author of the book based on net nakasa's life a native of nowhere so before the break we're talking about the character that has emerged in the book that you've written, Ryan. But I also want to ask you the same question, Mr. Tzid, uh, about the man behind what we have seen in the headlines, the story behind uh, the, the apartheid story, but so much the color that uh, Ryan was talking about. Well, Nat, Nat was, in fact, uh, uh, a very meek person, uh, politically speaking. He was not uh, a rabid revolutionary. Uh, he was very liberal in his approach. And uh, Joe Toller says he was a man ahead of his time who believed that uh, there were good people on the other side. We just need to find them and talk to them, and we will change this country. But in his real heart, Nat was just a a guy who wanted uh, his things easy, didn't stay in the township. Tabombeki tells the story of one evening um, <clears throat> when they had been drinking with him and uh, he needed a, a lift to Soweto. But when they got to Soweto, Nat didn't even know the place where he was supposed to, uh, uh, to be staying because Nat lived in, in town. Uh, he would check up with his white friends and if there wasn't a white friend tonight to check up with he would sit up with the guards security guards or the maids in the what was called the township in the sky which were all those little rooms uh, on top of the building so he was that mm. kind of guy so his approach towards this anti-apartheid war was not the kind of goose that we were now seeing with the um, Umkonto Wesizwe uh, as he was arrived, his remains were arriving yesterday doing the goose uh, step and, and all of that. That was not net. In fact, the Minister of Arts and Culture yesterday said he doesn't even think that uh, net, he is not aware that net held a membership card of the ANC. And when you look at his own uh, whole approach towards the politics of this country, mm. it wouldn't have been the ANC time. So what would he have made of the way that we are celebrating his life and his story today in 2014? He would probably have had something uh, very interesting to say. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, but uh, I think he would also have understood that uh, the pain that he suffered, uh, as Ryan was saying, symbolized the pains of many. 
he's have has become visible because of who he was and so in doing all of the things that are being done around net we're doing them also for those whose names we don't know he is almost like the symbol of the unknown citizen the unknown soldier who's lying somewhere Mm. Ryan, the story of his depression and uh, speculation around his suicide or whether or not somebody pushed him and all of that, was that all because he wasn't allowed to come back home or was there more to that story? You know, I think there's a big part of it that does lie in the fact that he wasn't allowed to come back home. Um, Nat was someone who felt the world very deeply. And I think when he was in the United States, he felt the injustice of what was going on in South Africa as he viewed it from afar very deeply and, and with great despair. Um, and the fact that, that he couldn't return weighed on him constantly. And also the fact that he couldn't stay in the U.S., that they didn't want him either. Um, you know, I had the um, FBI turn over their file on that to me. And um, it indicates they had been following him around for the time he was in the U.S. And it indicates that he had gone to immigration authorities several times and said, when I finish this fellowship at Harvard, can I stay here? And they said, no. They said, absolutely not. And so I think there were these big factors weighing mm. very, very heavily on him. Um, and the crumbling of the Hollywood-type dream. You know, here you are in the U.S. and it's not as great as what you saw it as back in, in South Africa. That's right. And, you know, I think when he first arrived in Boston, there was a, a sort of incredible sense of freedom at first, you know. There was no curfew for him. There, he didn't have to carry a passbook. Um, he got to attend classes at this very elite American university. Um, and so I think he was really buoyant at first, really excited. Um, but it, it very quickly uh, became apparent to him that the situation was a lot more complicated than, than he had realized. And I think a lot of that did owe to the fact that he had met and conversed with Malcolm X. Mm. All right, we have to take another short break. But after the break, I'd like us to look at just the state of journalism today and how he, what he would think of the way that we are doing things in 2014. But let's take another short break. Remember that if you do want to join in the conversation, do give us your thoughts on Facebook. It's Interface on SABC2. And also on Twitter, it is at Tembi Samahele or at Interface on SABC. We're we'll right back after this. Welcome back to the last segment of Interface today as we talk about the story of Net Nakasa and the symbolism that it carries for the South African people. And we are talking to Matata Tzedu, who is the executive director of SANEF, and also Ryan Brown, who is the author of the book based on Nakasa's life, A Native of Nowhere. So just reflecting then on, on the state of journalism in South Africa today, what would Net Nakasa make of the way we are and the way we report? Well. Maybe to start with, we have to go back to his own time and say um, the 50s and uh, early 60s, which is the early 60s is where he, he fits in, um, was a time of what has now come to be known as the drum the right. Era. Mm. Uh, and those guys, Bo, <coughs> Kentemba, Eskia, um, all of them, prided themselves in their ability to use English. So there was almost a competition about who can say this best than anyone else. So when you read, you will find um, uh, the, 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 there's a piece written by uh, one of them about a community of uh, Botswana who had moved to Botswana. Um, and then people would move from here to go and tell them what was happening back home. Um, and he, he, he doesn't say people went to Botswana to report. It says uh, the rumor migrated over the border <laughs> uh, into Botswana. You know, it's, it's that sort of thing. So okay. firstly, it, it is really about pride in your work, the, the, the need to learn more. And so when you look at uh, the uh, kind of writing today, it isn't full of that type of language. Um, it, it's it's tell, tell the story here and now. You don't have 
a whole page to do it. You have 300 words. Tell it in 300 words. Don't meander with rumors crossing borders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but the quality of, of, of the work that they produced was superb uh, also. But I hold the view that every generation produces the journalists that will tell the story of its time. And the net, wherever he is, if he's able to look at what is happening today, I'm sure he realizes that the journalists of today are telling the story of today in the manner that today demands of that story to be told. So then when we read uh, in the newspapers about the recent Net Nakasa Awards where a former Cape, Town's editor, a Cape Times editor was uh, awarded this uh, huge award and it was awarded for standing up to her bosses and one of the bosses was there and apparently there was some drama where he walked out. It just begs the question, does it, does, does the point that we're trying to put across that you need to be courageous in journalism is it carried across as well as it could be when we hear of the kind of drama that is happening in the newsrooms? The award is a, a pinnacle, in a way, of South African journalism trying to say to people it needs courage to do it. Whether you are writing the story or you're dealing with uh, commercial uh, uh, pressures or political pressures, now, pressures Every, from your own news. Right? Yeah, yeah. It, whether it's uh, corporate pressure, you, you, you need to have courage to stand up. Like Ned had the courage to stand up and say, I need to learn more. If you're going to say the only way I can learn is for me to become stateless, so stateless I'll be. So um, the, 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 the recent award you are referring to is just one of... Uh, SANEF and uh, the Neiman Society of Southern Africa and print media uh, South Africa have been doing the awards for more than 15 years uh, and it's almost like a who's who of South African journalism of the people who have won it um, the kind of drama that you're referring to it's the first time it happens so it doesn't take away from the significance of the award no it doesn't at all um, and, and uh, for me, it, it reinforces the point uh, uh, that uh, it needs courage, not only of the person who is winning, but even of the people who may be making the decision about who the winner must be. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Let's take a quick look at some of your Facebook messages. Kalanga Mtondolovani says, may his soul rest in peace. He inspired me to love writing. So that is a great one there. And Mfundo Lela says, great man indeed. I wish more of us young people could be educated about such unknown heroes who gave their lives for the freedom that we enjoy today. And that is the point at the end of the day, is it not, Ryan, that somebody needs to pick up that baton and somebody needs to go forward and, and tell the story even more and, and talk about what happened under apartheid. Is a lot of that going on? You know, I hope in telling the stories of people like Nat, uh, what we're reminded of is not necessarily all the particular details of their lives, but just the fact generally that there are so many of these stories to be told. Um, this incredibly diverse set of experiences that people have that we can draw upon, um, and, and lives that may not fall in lockstep, fall right in line with you know the stories told now um, by people in power about how they got here. You know, and so I think it's important to remember the the very sort of complex legacies. Um, of the lives people in this country led. That's right. Well, thank you for bringing us this story and thank you for also making sure that we hear about Net Nakasa as South Africans and also as people around the world who want to celebrate the liberty that we are enjoying here today in South Africa. But we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for making the time to join us here on Interface. To join us again next week at the same time from me, Temisa Machel and the team, good night. not only of the person who is winning, but even of the people who may be making the decision about who the winner must be. Mm, yeah. mm. Let's take a quick look at some of your Facebook messages. Kalanga Mtondolovani says, may his soul rest in peace. He inspired me to love writing. So that is a great one there. And Mfundo Lela says, great man indeed. I wish more of us young people could be educated about such unknown heroes who gave their lives 
for the freedom that we enjoy today. And that is the point at the end of the day, is it not, Ryan, that somebody needs to pick up that baton and somebody needs to go forward and, and tell the story even more and, and talk about what happened under apartheid. Is a lot of that going on? You know, I hope in telling the stories of people like Nat, uh, what we're reminded of is not necessarily all the particular details of their lives, but just the fact generally that there are so many of these stories to be told. Um, this incredibly diverse set of experiences that people have that we can draw upon, um, and, and lives that may not fall in lockstep, fall right in line with, you know, the stories told now. Um, by people in power about how they got here, you know, and so I think it's important to remember the the very sort of complex legacies um, of the lives people in this country led. That's right. Well, thank you for bringing us this story, and thank you, Dr. Tseiro, for also making sure that we hear about Net Nakasa as South Africans and also as people around the world who want to celebrate the liberty that we are enjoying here today in South Africa. But we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for making the time to join us here on Interface. To join us again next week at the same time from me, Temisa Machel, and the team. Good night. Mm -hmm.